Thank you, Seth. If I'm not here next week, you know why. <laughs> so maybe one of you guys can call me. And uh, uh, it's not my favorite Sunday. Well, we are. Well, every Sunday is my favorite, and uh, this is a great Sunday too because of a great passage, Ephesians chapter five, verses fifteen through twenty-one. Therefore, so he begins when that word therefore, drawing a, a, a principle of conduct from what he's already said, which is he's been telling us how to behave and how to live. So he says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. May he bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in prayer. In 1903, what the world had only dreamed of for millennia happened. A man flew. The Wright brothers had floated through the air on gliders, but th this was different. They added power to one. A small gasoline engine was built in their bicycle shop in Ohio that produced enough energy to turn two propellers, and everything changed. Sixty-six years later, men walked on the moon. Now that's a short version of the story, but one that shows everything needs energy, power to function. Even a glider needs wind power to lift it and carry it through the sky. That's obvious, I know, but it's the same in the Christian life. And that is not so obvious to a lot of saints. I say that because Paul instructed the Ephesian saints to be filled with the Spirit. Evidently, they were not aware of the necessity of the Holy Spirit, or they, they needed to re, be reminded that He is the engine. He is the power of the Christian life. Paul wrote this at just the right place in the letter. Beginning in chapter 4, he began instruction on Christian living, on what to do and what not to do. He began chapter 5 by directing the Ephesians to be imitators of God and walk in love. That's difficult. We're weak, and walking through this world is dangerous. It's, it's like walking through a minefield. Paul knew that. But he also knew that we are not alone in that walk. The Lord is with us. We have the Holy Spirit. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Paul has made that point twice in this book, in chapter 1, verse 13, and chapter 4, verse 30. He is our energy. He is a person. He's not a power or a force. He's the third person of the Trinity, and He empowers us to live selflessly, live sacrificial, sacrificially and obediently. It is essential that we know that, so that we might walk by the Spirit, to put it in the words of Galatians 5, verse 16. Well, Paul will get to the Spirit and our dependence on Him in a moment, but he still had much to say about our duties, our responsibilities in the Christian walk. He told the Ephesians to walk in love. He told them to wake up and to get walking and working 
And then he said in verse 15, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. Now it would seem a wise walk is one that follows Paul's instruction just given. Uh, do what is pleasing to the Lord and do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Now that calls for study, that calls for vigilance. That is a careful life, and all of that is true. But it seems Paul had something else and something more specific in mind, having told them to uh, not to sleep away their lives. He added in verse 16, making the most of your time. Now that is a wise life. The King James Version translates it, redeeming the time, which is actually literally what Paul wrote. It is an unusual way of referring to time because it means buy or buy up the time, redeem it. Redemption is a word from the marketplace where things are bought and sold. It was used of buying a slave out of slavery or paying the price to free a captive. It was a ransom payment. It came to be use of our, uh, of our salvation. Christ paid the price to set us free from sin's tyranny. He bought us at the cost of His own blood. That's the payment that satisfied God's justice and redeemed us. It's a very important word for explaining salvation, and so it's a sacred word. Paul knew that, and he chose to use it here because time is so valuable. There's really nothing more important in life than time. Nothing more valuable than that. It is a blessing that God has given us to use in His service and use in His worship in, in all that we do with our life. What is the chief end of man? That's the question, the first question of the shorter catechism. And the answer, you know, is man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And God has given us time for doing that. It's a gift. But it is limited. Once gone, it's gone forever. So we're to be like a shrewd merchant who recognized a rare or a valuable commodity or jewel in the marketplace, and he bought it up. Meaning, we're to do that. We're to possess it and use it. So, making the most of your time gives a very good sense to what Paul was telling the Ephesians to do. Make the most of your opportunities. The reason Paul gave for doing that is the days are evil. What does that mean? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Well, we might have thought he would have said, make the most of your time because your days are numbered. Time is short. That's true. The, the Psalms have much to say about that. Psalm 39, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Life is short. Time is fleeting. But Paul said, evil. And that is probably because the days are so evil that it is good for Christians to take every opportunity to do good, to help those in need and serve God. And time would fail me, to quote the author of Hebrews, if I recounted all the missionaries that have gone throughout the world and done good, have preached the gospel and lifted people out of darkness into light. And all of the Christians that have, have gone to backward places in societies and established hospitals and schools that have been a blessing to people, they've redeemed the time. Wise men and women will redeem the time and take their opportunities. But how exactly do we do that? <clears throat> And I ask that question because we live in a very busy age. We have all kinds of demands on our time. We have uh, all kinds of gadgets that, that are supposed to give us more free time, like cell phones and all, but all they've done is, 
is give us more opportunity to work even harder. So we're busy. How do we make the most of our time? So Paul gives some direction on that in verses 17 and 18. He wrote, understanding what is the will of the Lord. Nothing is more important than knowing God's will. That's where wisdom begins. And we know Christ's will by knowing His Word. That's where God's general will is revealed, such as chapter 4, verse 28. Don't steal, rather work with your hands. What is more difficult is discovering what some call the Lord's particular will or special will, such as what career should I pursue? Or, whom should I marry? Questions like that. That is more difficult. It begins with a knowledge and understanding of the general will of Christ. The principles of conduct clearly set forth in Scripture. But then it takes wisdom or skill in applying them to the circumstances of life. That involves prayer and thoughtful consideration, and, and very often it involves patience to wait on the Lord. Leon Morris wrote that the Christian way is not a mindless conformity to a set of rules. It involves skill and careful uh, sacrificial application of God's principles. Paul addressed that in, in 1 Corinthians 8 with the use and abuse of Christian liberty. What is okay in one situation is not in another. If exercising our Christian liberty would cause a weaker brother to stumble, don't do it. For, he wrote, through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. Now, there's a... a there the general principle of love, sacrificial love, guides us in the particular decisions that we make. But there's, there's something else that guides our decisions and enables us to understand correctly and act wisely, not foolishly. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. Paul introduced him in verse 18, and and His essential ministry in our lives with a general principle of the Lord's will. He wrote, and do not get drunk with wine. Now that is not a difficult principle to understand. Paul didn't say, don't drink it. He said, don't drink too much of it. You don't have to drink any of it at all. But if you do, don't get drunk ever. That's not mindless conformity or legalism. It's, it's wise conformity to the righteousness of Christ. And Paul gives the reason. Drunkenness leads to dissipation. Debauchery is another translation. Under the influence, people lose self-control. The alcohol takes over and turns people into fools. Tragic things happen when drinking is involved. Paul advocated an alternative. It is an antidote to folly. In fact, it makes people wise. Instead of filling up on wine, he said, be filled with the Spirit. That's an important command and should not be confused with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul spoke of that in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Now that's one way to translate and understand that verse. At the moment of faith, the Holy Spirit places the believer in the body of Christ. We are baptized into Christ and we are made equal members of the church. But often it is Christ who is described as the one who baptizes us spiritually. 
For example, in Mark chapter 1, verse 8, John the Baptist said, I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And that happened on the day of Pentecost when Christ poured out the Holy Spirit on his people and the church was born. So here, the Spirit is probably not the one who baptizes, but the one in whom we are baptized. In fact, you can translate chapter thir- uh, 1 Corinthians thir- 12, verse 13, as for, for in one Spirit we were all baptized. And I think that is the proper understanding of that verse. Christ is the, uh, the Holy Spirit, rather, is the spiritual element into which we are submerged. So by grace, Christ puts us in the Spirit, and we are united in Him in order to be joined together as a body, as the church. He is our spiritual environment. We move and exist in Him spiritually. We are also indwelt with the Spirit. Paul says we were all made to drink of one spirit. We are all in him and he is in us and he joins us together in a unity in a body in the church. We're all sustained and we're all refreshed by the Holy Spirit. That is true of every believer in Jesus Christ. All were baptized. It it happens at the moment that we are We believe in Christ. It happens at the moment of regeneration and faith. It happens once for all. It's the experience of every believer when we're born again. It's not repeated. It happens and it's permanent. Being filled with the Spirit is something different. It's a command to believe to those who have already been baptized in the Spirit. It is an experience that is repeated. There are numerous examples of it in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin. They'd been preaching the gospel in the temple, and they were arrested for doing that. And they were brought to the Sanhedrin, the supreme court of the Jewish people. It was an intimidating place to be for simple fishermen in which to defend themselves. But Luke wrote that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and he spoke to the court. He spoke of Christ as the one whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. That was brave. Then he said, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's clear. That's the gospel. And the council was impressed. Luke wrote, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed. This is the same Peter who two months earlier had deserted Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane and then denied Him three times in the courtyard of Caiaphas. Now he's bold and he's confessing Christ. It made an impression on the priests. So it's not surprising that two chapters later, in chapter 6, verse 7, Luke wrote, a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. In Acts chapter 9, after Paul's conversion, he was in Damascus, filled with the Spirit, and began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. He kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews and proving that Jesus is the Christ. Proving from Scripture that Jesus is Israel's Messiah. There are many other examples. And what characterizes these events is people are proclaiming the truth of God. And they're bearing witness to Christ. The filling of the Spirit is endowment with power to perform a spiritual task. And we see that in Ephesians 5. It also has to do with Christian living 
and Christian worship. The life filled with the Spirit is controlled by the Spirit, directed by the Spirit. That's suggested by the, con the connection to wine. Wine controls the drinker for evil. The Spirit controls the saint for good. One evidence that uh, you are filled with the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit in your life, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, fruitfulness, gentleness, self-control. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Well, we could add to that list Christ-likeness. And that's really what the fruit of the Spirit exhibits. The life of Christ. In John 13, Jesus gave His disciples an example when He knelt down and He washed their dusty feet. He, the Son of God, the Creator of heaven and earth, the One who sustains everything by the will of His power, holds the universe together with its billions of galaxies, made Himself a servant for 12, 12 proud, selfish men. When He returned to the table, He told them, I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. A person who is full of the Spirit is a servant. He or she puts others first. A person who is full of the Spirit is becoming like Christ. This is what the Holy Spirit produces in us. He produces the disposition of Christ in us increasingly. And He gives wisdom. Do not be foolish, Paul said, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And again, we know the will of the Lord by knowing the Word of the Lord, the Word of God, Scripture. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, verse 98. And then he adds later, the light of God's words give understanding to the simple. Do you want wisdom? Or do you want to be simple? If you want wisdom, know the Word of God. But wisdom is not only a, a work of study, it's a work of the Spirit in connection with study. It imparts wisdom to our minds. The Word of God does, but it does as the Spirit enlightens our minds. He guides us and He enables us to understand what the Word of God teaches, and we have Him within us. We've been the seal on our heart, He's there permanently to enable us to know to understand and to live, to walk wisely. It's the person of God in us. What an amazing thing. Do we take that lightly? That the third person of the Trinity is literally within us? It is the power that is added to our lives, just as the energy produced the, by a motor lifted a plane in 1903 and every year after that. And so too, the energy of the Holy Spirit lifts and carries us. The Christian life is a supernatural life. We cannot function without the Holy Spirit. He gives spiritual growth so that we become more and more like Christ. He gives obedience in life. And, and a love of righteousness. Paul then added to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. After that, he will give instruction on the Christian home and then the Christian warfare. But this is a description of public worship, of of the life of the church, the meeting of the church. It involves singing. Now, it involves other things. It involves teaching, and I would say principally teaching. When the Reformers came, 
and the Reformation took root, it is said they moved the altar from the center of the church and placed the pulpit in its place. In other words, teaching the Word of God is the great, the central feature of worship. But there are other things to it as well. Singing is one, and singing in various ways. And that's what Paul focuses on here. First, psalms, he says. And that may refer to the Old Testament psalms sung with the accompaniment of musical instruments. Hymns may refer to songs that were composed by Christians. And they would come, and they would meet, and, and someone who was gifted in that way would have written a, a simple hymn, and they would sing it. However these are understood, what, what is clear is that spiritual singing is a natural expression and outflowing of the Holy Spirit. Christians are to be a singing people. But notice how Paul put it. Singing to one another in psalms. Obviously Paul didn't mean that we're, we're to turn the church service into an opera. Speaking suggests communication of truth. So when we sing, we should sing clearly and thoughtfully in an attempt to communicate the words of the hymn. We should sing it thoughtfully. Confess, I sometimes find myself just uh, doing it by rote and not really thinking about what I'm singing, but we ought to be doing that. Uh, that if, what hymns are to do, what they're intended to do, is to communicate truth to us in this unique way of song. And they should instruct us, which means what is primarily important is the content of the hymn. Because truth, and truth alone, edifies. It builds up the individual in the faith. Music moves our emotions, that's good and right, that's part of what we are. But emotions are led astray if they're not ruled by truth. In Acts 2, those who were filled with the Spirit were said to be speaking of the mighty deeds of God. That's what should fill our hymns. The mighty acts of the triune God. That will be spirit-filled worship. When our hearts are filled with the knowledge of God and His grace and, and, and His greatness, then hymns will be the natural outflow and will characterize the church. That's what Paul wrote in Colossians 3, verse 16. The Word of Christ, Scripture, is to dwell richly in our hearts. So the Word of God is essential to the Christian life and to Christian worship. The, the Word of Christ is to dwell richly in our hearts, and we are to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The early, the early church did that. <clears throat> At the beginning of the second century, in the year 112, the Roman governor Pliny wrote a famous letter to the Emperor Trajan describing the Christians in his province. He was wondering, what do I do with these people? Do I kill them or do I do something else? Now, he wrote about them and he wrote uh, that their custom was to uh, that of, of meeting on a fixed day before dawn and reciting a hymn antiphonally to Christ as God. Now, I don't want to depart too much from my sermon, but as I thought of that, I thought, what an amazing thing. Pliny was a governor in northern, the northern part of Asia Minor, or Turkey. Don't read a lot about that in the missionary travels, but within 60 years after Paul's death, if we put it at the year A.D. 60, the world is full of churches. They're all over Asia Minor. They're all around the Mediterranean world. They're as far up in, into Europe as France and other places. And people wonder, argue against the gospel as being something that was made up. 
I heard one of the atheists say that, that, uh, well, one, one explanation for the New Testament and all that it says about the resurrection and the deity of Christ is it was made up. But how do you explain within a generation the world being full of churches? They believed it and they had grounds for believing it. And the church would fill the, the ancient world. But this is what is characteristic according to this pagan governor. They sing hymns. And they sing hymns to Christ as God. They sang hymns that had theological significance. Full of good doctrine, truth. And that's, that's true characteristically of the church. History bears it out. Where, where there were, were great movements of the Spirit, there were great hymns that were produced. We see that during the Reformation. Luther and Calvin reintroduced congregational singing to the church meeting. The singing of, of psalms was very important to the Huguenots, the Protestants of France, who were greatly persecuted eventually driven out of France in the 17th century by Louis XIV, they gained strength through the singing of hymns. I have an old book, which actually it's a couple of books, a set of books on the Reformation in France. It's almost 200 years old. And in reading it, I noticed that hymn singing was frequently mentioned. The Huguenots loved to sing. There was a Huguenot prince who spent the, his last days in prison calmly playing his instrument and singing the psalms before he was led off to a martyr's death. Psalms and hymns have a real ministry to the soul in times of trial. During the Great Awakening, the church was given the hymns of the Wesleys and Top Lady. Charles Wesley wrote over 6,000 hymns. Great movements of God produce great hymns of the faith. One sign of being filled with the Spirit is singing. Making melody with your heart to the Lord. And, and really, where, that's where true singing happens. Not audibly, but inaudibly in the heart. You, you may not be gifted to sing vocally, I'm certainly not. But heaven rejoices to the sound of a saint singing in his or her heart. That's really worship. That's not all. Thanksgiving is another sign. Verse 20, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. We have the Trinity in this passage, if you've noticed. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, then the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person, and then giving thanks to God, even the Father, the first person of the Trinity. All in the Bible, the word all, where he says, giving thanks for all things, doesn't always mean all without exception. In other words, everything that there is. John Stott qualified the all things here, stating, we can't give thanks to God for blatant evil. God hates sin. So all doesn't mean all in the sense of everything, but all kinds of things. We give thanks to Him for blessing us in the midst of evil, and so that is how we give thanks and providing for us at all times and, and knowing that, that the greatest tests and the longest tests are actually used for our blessing. So we don't give thanks to God for sin, but we do give Him thanks for upholding us in the midst of it and knowing that He's taking it away from us in sanctification. In fact, the afflictions of life as as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18, are used to transform us from glory to glory, he says. So there's much to give thanks for. 
in some of the oddest things and some of the things we might not think we should give thanks for. But we are to be giving thanks for all things throughout our life. John Chrysostom, the fourth century church father, had as his habitual doxology, glory be to God for all things. And when he died a painful death in a cruel exile, those were his last words. Finally, Paul said, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Be subject to one another. That, that was a radical idea in that day and age. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, Paul wrote that all kinds of people were baptized into Christ's body. Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free. So imagine this. A Jew was to submit to a Gentile. The dogs. And a Gentile to the Jew. And all the free men submitting to the slaves. And there were a lot of slaves in the early church. And they did it. What a thing that was. One of the great examples of that is Onesimus and Philemon. Onesimus was a household slave who had had enough of it and he fled to Rome. But in God's providence, there he met Paul. And he was converted. And he served Paul for a time and then Paul sent him back to his master Philemon, who was one of Paul's converts in Colossae. And he sent him back with the letter we know as Philemon. And in it was a plea for mercy. He called the slave, the saved slave, my child Onesimus. And he wrote to Philemon, perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Now that's the power of the gospel and the work of the Spirit. It makes slaves and masters, brothers, equals in the church, which would only weaken the institution of slavery. It is destroyed in the church. And there is a tradition that Philemon freed Onesimus, who became an elder in the church in Ephesus. I think that's a reasonable tradition. That takes the grace of God. And God has poured out His grace on the church to bring different people together. This is the, the healing of a broken world. It's not in governments. If you depend on government to bring about the changes that are fundamental and necessary, it'll never happen. It is only in the church where that happens. It is only by the grace of God where transformation takes place. And the world should see that. The world should see that in us. It's a testimony to God's sovereign grace, God's healing grace. One of the, the famous old African-American spirituals is there is a bomb in Gilead. I know you've heard that. You're all familiar with it. It answers the question, and this you may not have known, of Jeremiah 8, verse 22. Is there no balm in Gilead? The prophet asked. Is there no medicine there? And one version of that first refrain is, there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is power enough in heaven to cure a sin-sick soul. And we have it within us to change us, to be regenerated, to be born again and transformed, miraculously transformed. What we have within us is not us. It's the Spirit of God who is doing that transformation now. He's doing it in the life of every believer. So Paul instructed them, instructed us, to be filled with the Spirit and live in His transforming power. It's the power that produces joy 
that produces obedience to God's glory and to the benefit of others. And so we should pray for that. Pray for it, for each and every one of us. There is power for the Christian that makes the wounded whole and joyful and obedient. But only for the Christian. Only for the believer in Christ. Have you believed in Him? If you're here without Him, you are still in your sins, lost and doomed, and I can't put that more seriously and frighteningly doomed. But Christ's nail-pierced hands are open wide to the lost and rebellious. That's Isaiah 65, verse 2. And He invites you to come, invites you to believe in Him. And all who do are received by Him, forgiven, justified, declared right with God, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a life of eternal value. Trust in Christ. And you who have walk by the Spirit and bear fruit for Him. Well, let's stand and sing hymn number 13 in the Songs of Praise book, Wonderful, Merciful Savior. Hymn number 13. Father, we do thank You for Your grace. And our hearts should hunger for that. What a blessing. We have considered at length the person and work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the third person of the Trinity. We thank you for him who is the comforter and does give comfort to our troubled hearts. And we are often troubled. Often we have doubts. And the Spirit of God is there to give us comfort and encourage us. But Lord, we give thanks and praise to the triune God. To you, the Father, for drawing up the plan of salvation, for choosing a people for yourself, a multitude beyond numbering. For the Son who gladly came into this world to redeem those you had chosen, and for the Spirit of God who came and drew us to a saving knowledge of Christ and an understanding of the Godhead, the triune God, God, full of grace and mercy, we thank you for all that we've received from you. May we increase in our knowledge and our wisdom and walk in a way that's worthy of our calling. We pray these things in Christ's name. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.